All right. Hey, welcome to another episode of Paul Moore Talk Shit. Today, I am talking shit with Matt Abe. Matt, what's up? Not much, are you? You're right. I'm I am very excited about this interview. I have yeah, done a lot of interviewed. I've interviewed um, Tyson Fury. I've interviewed Ant Middleton. Obviously, I've interviewed Smith. I've interviewed Chris Ramsey. I've interviewed a lot of prominent people. I'm not even kidding. This is probably the most excited I've been about a podcast interview. <laughs> Mate, no pressure. <laughs> Really not. No really pressure. Not. So, mate, I've got so many questions that I want to ask you. Um, Have we got a day or? Mate, we've got, we've got two days. We're on a two-day seminar with Matt That's Abe. <laughs> We're on a TED Talk with Matt Abe. So my, my first question is, right, is that me and my daughter, I watch loads of cooking shows, loads of cooking shows, loads of kitchen nightmares, health kitchens, uh, great British menus. We watch bake offs and all that kind of shit, right? The first question I want to ask you is why the fuck would you want to become a chef? Uh, for me, it was just an absolute passion and love. Yeah. Um, the kitchen, the atmosphere of the kitchen and being in the kitchen under that pressure at certain times, I just get an absolute kick out of. Really? Yeah. I mean, when I was young, when I was, uh, well, I started when I was 16. Yeah. So I left school, started yeah. to become a chef. Yeah. Um, and you're, a fr- you're from Australia originally, uh, yes, right? Yeah. Because you have no now. Australian accent now. <laughs> No, I've been over here 14 years now. Really? So, yeah. There are a few words I'll slip out every now and then. Have you, are you getting a bit of a cockney? Are you, are you dropping any twang yet? Uh, no, not really. Not really. No. I think maybe a few words. You haven't called me boss man or anything like <laughs> no, that. Yet. <laughs> so no, 16, <laughs> we, <laughs> we went for, straight from school into... Yeah, so I think growing up as a kid, I had this passion with... I love cooking. Yeah. I, love, I love food, of course. Yeah. Um, but I also had this kind of ambition that I think I actually wanted to join the armed forces. I, really? I enjoy the outdoors and I sort of enjoyed that level of discipline and kind of, uh, I think it was just really for myself. That's why I wanted to be part of that kind of camaraderie and something that's disciplined and very driven. Um, and then just selecting subjects through school. I was very fortunate at the school I went to. We had a, a cook, commercial cookery school, mm-hmm. uh, like course there that we could do. Mm-hmm. Um, and it just reaffirmed my love even further for this is something I really enjoy and something I'd really love to do. And I used to love watching cooking shows as well yeah. when I was younger. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, basically I went and did like a works, uh, a week, uh, work placement. Um, and jokingly on the first day I joked to my mum, I was like, they're going to give me a job at the end this week. And my mum was like, come on, you've been here one day. Yeah. Like, stop, yeah, stop yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, and on the, the Friday afternoon. And were you even allowed to cook anything on the workplace, man? Uh, yeah, I kind of just got involved because you've got to think when you're going into a restaurant or mm-hmm. into an environment like that, you you have no idea what's going on. You don't know what to do. And it's just very much, right, cut this, do this, do that. Yeah. It's just bulk. It's bulk preparation. You yeah. know? It's masses, masses of work. And it was on the last day that the chef executive chef called me into his office to like have a catch up for the week and see how I got on. Yeah. And he was like, have you actually thought about this as a career? Mm-hmm. Um, and I was like, well, yeah, I'd love to. That sounds like a really cool thing. Mm-hmm. And he said, well, there's a thing called an apprenticeship, so you yeah. can undertake an apprenticeship. Yeah. I was like, oh, wow, that sounds amazing. So I walked out on cloud nine, ran and saw my mom, told my mom. My mom was like, well, like, what's all this happened? Yeah. Um, I said, right, so can I become a chef? And then typical of the mom, mom, mom always said, let's ask your dad. Uh, and my dad's answer straight away was, no, you're going to finish school. Um, so I pleaded with them over the weekend. Mm-hmm. Uh, my mum had the contact details from my teacher at school, gave them a call and she said, look, if it's what he wants to do, just let him do it. And if it fails, if he fails at it, mm-hmm. he can always go back and finish his schooling as an adult. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I went back to school for a week and for the first time I became the naughty kid. I didn't <laughs> care about my assignments. I was rocking on my chair, listening to music in class. You start becoming the naughty kid in school and then you quite literally just went straight into that job and that was you in. Yeah, I jumped in straight after, like one week. Yeah. There's a question that I, that I've wrote down there, which was that high pressure, high stress environment. Do you think someone's either got it, got what it takes to deal with that or not? Because sometimes, again, I'm going to throw in a cooking show. I'm going to throw in some of like master chef where they take these home chefs and they're okay in the environment of cooking in the studio sure. and then they put them in a restaurant and they fucking shit their pants. Do you think that's something that someone has or something that can be trained or? It's definitely something that can be trained. Yeah. Um, whenever I'm employing someone in the restaurant uh, mm-hmm. or looking for, for future talent or trying to look at those people, it's not necessarily the skills they've got today that I'm judging them on. I just particularly look for people's attitude. Yeah, me too. Um, and if they've got the attitude of that hunger, that I will never give up. I'll just keep trying and trying. Then that, that's all we can ask for. And yeah. then the rest will come in time. Um, look, there are certain people that will perform better under 
higher amounts of pressure and stress yeah for sure um but I, it depends on the situation i mean i get a real kick and a buzz off a busy service in the restaurant we're fully booked restaurant we've got um you know food coming out left right and center everywhere yeah. we've kind of not problems, but running for me, running the service, running the pass and or, uh, orchestrating the service in the kitchen is amazing. It's a massive challenge because you've got to deliver everyone's, not just a la carte meal, but if they're having a tasting menu, you've got courses, you've got to make sure the food comes out at the right time to match with the wine. Um, yeah, there's a massive experience and expectation that comes with that. And yeah. it's all about timing. Um, and in the kitchen, we leave everything in five minute uh, increments. So it's a, it's a very short pressurized period of time. but yeah. Again and again and again, all the time. So, so five minutes, because I saw something that you posted on your Instagram the other day where it was like a bit of paper, or might it might have been typed up, but it just had the times yep. yeah, for so every table. I've never seen that on yeah, any cooking so show. We, um, Is that just your restaurant that does that? Uh, well, I don't or know. Is it just you probably, that does there's that? There's probably other restaurants <laughs> that do follow that system. Yeah. But the way, the way we work is... We don't use any like electronic computer checks. All the all the orders are still handwritten. Yeah. Um, and we're very blessed. We've got a very small restaurant, fourteen tables. Yeah. Um, it's only a few meters from the kitchen to the dining room, so yeah. it's not a not a big ordeal. Yeah. Um, and I I love that old school system and that way that it works because it works so well. Communication is is always clear. Yeah. Um, it's not you don't have to punch in, type a little silly message on the on the on the computer and yeah. then print out the check or anything yeah. like that. It's right there. And that what you saw there the other day, yeah. um, that's the the table timesheet. So the waiter will come in, write the table number down, and we write down the time that the, the order comes into the kitchen. Yeah. And then as each course is called away, they yeah. then write that time down. So that's yeah. basically my um, you know, control board so yeah. essentially. So I'm there controlling all that. Um, and then obviously moving the checks around. So it's yeah. like a giant game of chess. Yeah. Um, it's like being an air traffic controller in the same sense. You've got to make a plan, right, okay, we're going to go on this table, or hang on, let's maybe wait for the next table, we'll go with those two tables And together. is it you that decides that? Yes, I'm the one that's controlled. Well, myself or my sous chef, whoever's running the pass, mm-hmm. um, ultimately controls what we're going to go on. Is when. running the pass where you thingy the tickets? Yeah, so I will, yeah, so the order will come in, the waiter will give me the order, I'll yeah. call the order on, the kitchen yeah. answers. Um, oh, Matt, does everyone then, say yes, chef? They sure do. I fucking love it. <laughs> yes, I love that meat. Yeah. Um, but you have that kind of yeah standard where we have those standard responses, so everyone yeah. understands what's going on. Um, and then yeah, I'm running the service, so I'll be like, right, let's go five minutes on the starters on table one. Mm-hmm. Um, and we might be we'll count that down from five minutes. So when we say we go five minutes, sometimes it's a little bit more, sometimes yeah. it's a lot less. Yeah. It just depends on yeah. where we're at, how organized we are. Yeah. Um, and then when we get down to say maybe two minutes remaining on that table, that's when one will call the next table on. So it's like a constant, constant yeah. movement all the time. Yeah. Sick. So we've, we've took a big jump from 16 year old Matt <laughs> starting off in the kitchen to, to run and restaurant Gordon Ramsay in this 16 year old phase. What was that? Was that like pot washing and that, or was it college? No, it's apprenticeship. I, um, so there's some time in yeah. college, right? So, yeah, so I undertook my apprenticeship, um, which was one day a week at college, yeah. four days a week working in the in the restaurant. Yeah. Um, and I was very much, yeah, a part of the team in the restaurant. Um, when I look back at it now, some of the responsibilities or things that I was allowed to do as a 16-year-old, yeah. I don't think I would actually have trusted myself <laughs> to do that on my own. Yeah. Um, but I guess the level of the restaurant I was working in wasn't necessarily the highest standards yeah. for sure. Yeah. Uh, so... It could get away with, you know, obviously I made lots of sandwiches and things. We, the place I worked in, we used to cater for about a thousand people a day. Oh, shit. Um, yeah. So breakfast, lunch and dinner and everything in between. Um, we had multiple food outlets. Mm-hmm. Uh, we used to do big functions. So, you know, weddings for up to 400 people or yeah. pro- big, pro- big special dinners and things yeah. for people. So yeah. I had a very broad experience within that business. Um, I only stayed there six months because yeah. I, I wanted more. I wanted to learn better skills. Yeah. I realized that putting everything in the deep fryer is not the answer how to cook. <laughs> um, so I wanted to better myself. And um, I was very fortunate. I, uh, one of the chefs there at the time, uh, a guy called Andy took me under his wing. Mm-hmm. He got frustrated himself with being in that environment. He left, found a new job, mm-hmm. um, which, and then basically contacted me and said, Hey, look, do you want to come and work here? This is a, a better environment. Yeah. And to which I went and joined the team there. And I, again, I did another six months in that next job. Yeah. And I was still yearning for more. I just wanted, 
I wanted to be pushed. I wanted to work. Do you think some level you wanted to be the best? Did you know about Michelin stars and things like that? No, back I, then, knew, I knew about, uh, so in Australia we have uh, like chef hats. So you right. get one hat, two hat, three hat. Um, I knew about some great restaurants um, and my mum and dad, uh, after I completed my first year of my apprenticeship, let me choose any restaurant that I wanted to go to. And they yeah. took, took us out for a really good meal and it was an amazing experience. Yeah. And that just all of a sudden reconfirmed my decision that I loved fine dining. Yeah. Not just the food. I just loved as a guest, the whole experience, how special it can make you feel and yeah. how it can transform you for a couple of hours. Matt, tell me about this for, for, for the listeners as well as me. What is kind of the definition of fine dining? Because you hear that quite a lot, right? You do. And I know what it is because I've experienced it, but what, what would you say fine dining is? Fine dining for me is you come to an amazing restaurant that is not just great food, great wine or great service. Mm-hmm. It's, an, it's all of those things together, plus an amazing uh, decor. Obviously, decor can all be up to personal taste. It can yeah. be very modern. It can be very classical. Um, you know, it's a kind of place that I think you can go to and not, need to want for anything because everything's just there. It happens seamlessly. Yeah. You know, if you drop your napkin, someone's replaced it for you instantly, or there's this, this, this air about the, um, the whole experience. It's, yeah. it's seamless. Do you know what I would describe it as? Memorable. That like you rem- That's what we try to make. Is it? <laughs> yeah, it's just that whole fine dining experience. It's just memorable and you want to tell people about it. And it's not just telling them about the food. No, it's everything because it's, in a restaurant, it's not just the food, it's not just the service, it's not just the wine. It's every aspect of that plays a major part in creating those memories for yeah. the guests when they come to a restaurant. Because, um, you know, a restaurant like ours where I'm working, a lot of people, it's a one time, it's a special occasion restaurant. It's an anniversary, some big celebration, a momentous occasion in their life they want to celebrate and be able to savor it and remember it forever. Yeah. Um, and I, it's our what I believe is our responsibility to make sure that we do our very best to, to make that happen for people and to, you know, at the bare minimum meet expectations, but always go for the extra bit and try to exceed those and transform people to a whole different place. You know, the best part that I love about it is where people like look at their watch later on and be like, Oh my gosh, we've been here for four hours. (laughs) That that's just been (laughs) this period of time where time's just disappeared. Yeah. Um, And that's regardless of, of what experience you're having and to understand creating that special moment for every guest, regardless of the meal they've ordered, the wine. It's not about how much money you spend or how much, what, what food you order. It's yeah. just about trying to create that magical moment for every guest that comes through the door. Fuck me, dude. I'm getting fucking goosebumps. <laughs> listening to that shit. Jesus Christ. Wow. Okay. <laughs> so your first experience of fine dining with, is with your mom and dad. Yep. You chose the best restaurant. And then was it a case of, lit a fire in you again yeah i think for myself that that experience reconfirmed my my belief that i wanted to be in these amazing restaurants yeah um and uh, i was very fortunate i got i got an opportunity to go to a a restaurant i applied for a job went Mm -hmm. for my trial did my day and uh the head chef said oh we haven't got any jobs at the moment i was like okay cool he goes oh just keep in touch keep in touch so i called him two times a week for six weeks (laughs) Um, I don't know whether he just gave in and was like, right, actually there's a position available. Yeah. But yeah, he came to me and said, right, we've got a job for you. You can start. So I gave my notice and my last job and then moved straight away. And yeah. um, that was a, a role that I stayed in for four and a half years in that restaurant. I finished my apprenticeship. I yeah. moved through the kitchen. What was it between that restaurant and the other ones then? Why did you stay for so long? Um, it's just somewhere I had this, I don't know, I just feel, felt a connection to it. Um, I loved going to work every day. Yeah. Uh, I was learning. It was. It wasn't easy for sure. It was challenging times, challenging moments, days, weeks, months, years. It could be a hard, hard patch you go through. Yeah. Um, but I always found that I was learning. There was such a buzz to the place. We we were so we were such a busy restaurant. We were open seven days a week. Mm. Um, there was such a great teamwork and the camaraderie. And I've made some amazing friends mm-hmm. um, through through this industry over the years. Mm-hmm. Some of which you work, I've worked with for years, or I've only worked with some people for a, a week or so a few months, but you're still friends with them. And yeah. um, that's the most, that's one of the greatest things I love about the industry that we're in is that it allows you to travel the world. You can have connections with people. Yeah. Um, and it's a, a lot smaller industry than people give it credit Dude, for. Dude, you know, sometimes. I noticed, I noticed that quite a lot. And I think that's one of the things I love is when you see, obviously, I'm following a lot of popular chefs on Instagram that I'm like, they're eating each other's restaurants. And they're praising each other's food and they're... Yeah, I think... When um, they're on someone like the Great British Menu, they kind of know each other already. And I'm like, eh! Yeah, I think, I think 
a modern chef has now have moved on. Society's moved on massively, hasn't yeah. it? Um, yeah. And I think it's not, everyone's not about, oh, that's mine. You can't have it. Everyone's a lot more it's sharing more abundance. now. There is more abundance. Obviously, yeah. there's, there's so many more amazing restaurants in the world now. You can go anywhere and have an amazing meal. Yeah. Um, it doesn't have to be Michelin star, but you know, there's just look at how many restaurants are available in, in London alone. Um, you could eat out lunch and dinner every day for the you year. You could spend 180 not... quid on a fucking takeaway. <laughs> you could do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, London's incredible. London's yeah, it's incredible got it's got a plethora. It's got the it's got everything. I think it's got the low end, it's got the top end, it's got everything in between. Yeah. Um there's something for everyone and there's, you know, something for everyone at every occasion. So when in your career did you end up in England, London then? Uh, so, uh, 2001, yeah. um, no, sorry, 2007, yeah. I moved to the UK, yeah. uh, a friend of mine, a uh, Scottish guy was getting married, mm-hmm. um, and he asked me to be the best man at his wedding. And I yeah. thought, well, just make one trip rather than two, save some money there. Um, <laughs> so I saved up for my, uh, my visa, got yeah. my working holiday, uh, visa application yeah. sorted out, came over for the wedding a couple of weeks in Edinburgh, um, moved down to London. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was very for- I was fortunate that my chef that I worked with in Sydney for four and a half years was very good friends with Gordon, mm-hmm. um, and basically they'd I'd asked well, you know, one of my boys is coming over. Um, are there any any jobs available? Yeah, and the answer was yeah. Which restaurant does he want to work at? So I chose at the time I chose Claridge's, mm-hmm. uh, and yeah, I Claridge's a hotel, yeah, right? With it. Though, well, we used to have a Gordon Ramsay restaurant in Claridge's. It was yeah. there for about twelve years. Yeah. Uh, and, um, yeah, I chose to go there mm-hmm. and I just went and started yeah. and I was hooked. Uh, how fortunate they offered to sponsor me, mm-hmm. uh, which obviously means. Oh, I does that stay. mean you could stay here? Yeah. That means I could stay here a lot longer. Yeah. So I had to go back to Australia for a short period of time, yeah. uh, while the visa application got approved and all that through and then came back and yeah, the rest is history. I've never left since. So it's, yeah. um, it's also where I met my wife. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just an amazing industry, amazing career to have, I believe. Um, very fulfilling. It's mad that I'm like, what the fuck will make you do that? And you make, I kind of want to do it now. You've sold, <laughs> you've sold it to me. What's it's the hardest not, part about being a chef? Uh, the hardest part I think is the, doing what we do every day. That is intense. Um, and yeah. Cause it's it, like, what does a day look like for you? Uh, a day for me, um, well, I get in the kitchen between sort of eight and nine in the morning, uh, in the morning, obviously we've got prep. Yeah. So we're getting ready for lunch. Yeah. Um, about quarter to 11, everyone stops the prep. We, we, we fully clean the kitchen and we set up for the lunch service. Yeah. Uh, myself and the sous chefs go around, check all the sections, make sure everything's right. Mm-hmm. Service starts at 12. Um, we send the last main course normally about three, three mm-hmm. 30, mm-hmm. uh, jump on any more prep. We need to top up again for dinner. Uh, take a break from half four to half five. Uh, s- dinner service starts at six. Uh, last booking is nine fifteen, so probably get the last order in nine thirty, quarter to ten. Jeez. Uh, send the last main course uh, about ten thirty, ten forty five. Holy shit! Um, and the last dessert depends, depending on how you know what, what meal they're having. Yeah. Um. Yeah. The team, most of the team, normally finishes sort of around about eleven, um, and then. Pastry a little bit later, of course, but they also start a little bit later in the morning. Yeah, that's a long old day. It is. Um, but the thing for me is like, yeah, the hours is one thing. Yeah. Um, but the hardest part for me is the attention to detail goes in. That's what I find the the tiring part of it, or that's the exhausting part. It's the attention to detail, the yeah. focus that's required for every single plate of food that comes out of that kitchen every day. And not yeah. just the plate of food, but everything we do is literally attention to detail on everything. Yeah. And is that the is that the what you would say is the difference or one of the difference makers between where you're at in your career. Basically the difference between Mitchell and Star and other places is attention to detail. Is that yeah, one of them? Yeah, it's attention to detail but consistency. Mm. Consistency is the, I think that, that's the deal breaker right there. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, it's every day, you know, regardless of what's going on, you've got to bring your A game. You've got to execute what you set out to do every day and obviously um, uh, as a chef you have to ver- you know you order in tomatoes today and you order tomatoes tomorrow but they're not necessarily going to be the same so you've got to adjust and pivot all the time to you know combat the the challenges of, of guests guest requests guest requirements um the food that comes in every day you know how we're going to adapt evolve move um because you know nothing's it doesn't always come in perfect so you yeah. have to 
okay, tomato is a bit smaller. We have to adjust. We have to do this. We have to do that. You know how you how you go about working that. Um, the, the the sea bass today might be a bigger fish, so it's going to take a little bit longer to cook. So how are we going to factor that into the the service as to not then start That's to have crazy. a knock on like, effect? I wouldn't even most normal people wouldn't even consider that would be a thing. The sea bass might be a little bit bigger, so it'll take a little bit longer. Or the tomatoes are too small. Yeah, there's there's everything. I mean, look, you face that. I mean, every single day, there's it, it's Mother Nature you're working with. It's not it's not a factory. It doesn't just pop out perfect things all the time. You've got to work with things. You have to evolve and understand how that can work every day. And and, what, and as challenging as that is, Matt, is that also do you think part of the reason why I love it so much? It is. I get a massive kick and a buzz out of that. Yeah. Um, I do. I do like challenges. Yeah. Um, I've always been a person that I think I've always asked questions. If someone said, I'll do this, I'll be like, why? Yeah. I, I did. I was never just a, okay, just carry on. I always wanted to know the why, the how. Um, and I think that's got that a lot of the time has to come from you within. Mm. Not everyone's always going to give you the answers. You have mm. to go and find them yourself sometimes. Mm. And you have, that's, you know, particular people, you know, I don't think everyone necessarily has that, yeah. that desire or drive. Yeah. And when we talk about, so you mentioned you've got to be on your ear game. What keeps you on your ear game? Um, I listen. I love what I do. Yeah, I absolutely adore it. Yeah. Um, I'm very proud of what I've done in my career. Um, I'm proud of my team. I'm proud of the food that we we have. I'm, I love I love the the privilege and the joy I get out of working with some of the best produce in the world. Um, yeah. you, know, you should see me when I'm there. You know, getting the first peas of the spring. You know, I'm literally like a little kid's just seeing the biggest You're candy peeing. shop in the You're world. I'm literally so, yeah. <laughs> you get so excited about those amazing bits of produce because yeah. you know how good they taste. And um, I think as a young chef, you don't have that. That doesn't come until later on. Mm. Um, I don't think as a chef, you start to really grow and develop um, your palate or your your style or your, your substance till around about the age of 30. Yeah. Um, because when you're young, you're just going in, getting on with the job every day, doing whatever you can, trying getting to make abuse, your way getting abuse, getting abuse, no, getting cheered. Yeah. No, look, that's that, that's a hard. That's a one of the hard things that is obviously it's a hard place to work. It's yeah. a hard environment. It's high stress. Yeah. Um, but the industry is working very hard to to move forward and to move on. And yeah. look, everyone in every job, every career can always go back in my day, back in my day. Yes. But we're not back in my day. We're yeah. we're in today. So, so it's go- it's moving forward from that. Of whole course, it's oh massive. I suppose it's the same as the, the, the we've had a few of the guys, um, ex SAS guys on Jay Morton, Ant Middleton, Ollie Ollerton, and they say that it's totally different now. So it's totally different in the chef. It's totally different. Is it totally different? I yeah. mean. So how do you keep standards so high? I suppose it's probably a skill as well, isn't it? Keeping standards so high without the fucking... Well, you have to... That has to come from the top. Mm. The, the top is what has to change, not the bottom. Um, so the top has to... The, the lead by example. Uh, yeah, you have to set that example. You yeah. have to... Because otherwise you just revert back to... Back in my day. Yeah. And that's not what we can do. So you have yeah. to, you have to, at the top, you have to make those changes. Yeah. And as hard as they seem sometimes, or as, as disbelieving as you think, oh, surely I don't have to do that like that now. But yeah. it's nice to see that evolution happens and how, how things become better. Yes. Um, and then when you do get through the, the hard part, change is hard for everyone. Yeah. Change is always the hardest thing. Yeah. But as soon as you get through the change, you look back and go, why do I not do that sooner? <laughs> Um, and that's one of the biggest, uh, the biggest things that I think, um, you know, is, is that's a challenge every day as well to, yeah. to keep reanalyze. And that's what we do. We reanalyze what we do every single day, every plate of food. I reanalyze it. Think, is that the best we can do? Can we do better? Um, and I think that's the hunger within that kind of, you know, don't, I don't stand for, you know, mediocrity or yeah, near enough's good enough. It's, yeah. it's not about that for me. It's. It's that search for perfection, but obviously perfection doesn't have a, an end. It's it's a continuing evolution. All yeah, the it's time. like the um, it's like the horizon, right? Yeah, but it keeps getting further, not further and further away, but it keeps moving every day. Yeah, um, and yeah, it's that pressure we put on as chefs. We put that pressure upon ourselves. Mm. Um, obviously, you know, we've got guests to guests to please, um, and people expect. Mm. You know, the world expects amazing things. Yeah, um, rightfully so, um, and that that's. That's one of the challenges that I do enjoy every day. Yeah, sick. So that 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 challenge itself, that pushing, is one of the things that keeps you on your A game. What do you do? Because I noticed that you you're in the gym. I noticed that you knew James <laughs> and Darren. Is that one of the things that you do to stay on top of your your, your own game? Or 
Yeah, that's something, um, to be honest, I really only got, when I was younger, I used to do a lot of sport yeah. uh, while I was at school, you know, summer sport, winter sport, used to always do it. I was very, very active. Yeah. Uh, and then when I started my career at 16, all I really did was cook yeah. and work. That's, I just invested all my time and energy into that. Yeah. Um, and yeah, a few years ago, uh, you know, my wife was like, look, you're a miserable bastard now. You need to sort yourself out because no, but I was, you know, I was, I was a bit overweight, you yeah. know, and I didn't have health issues and that, but you know, it's, it all comes self-esteem, you know, all those, all those things, you know, yeah. and obviously, obviously when you become a figurehead, people are looking at you even more than yeah. before. And yeah. obviously that plays a big part, I think on, on your mind, you know, yeah. and I, I don't think I'm a very egotistical person. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I'm very stubborn. So it took her a lot of years of kicking my ass to get me to go to the gym. Um, I was definitely that person that before would sign up to the gym, go once and then pay for two years and yeah. not actually ever go again. Yeah. Um, but yeah, she, yeah, she really pushed me because she, you know, she had made a change in her life as well. And that kind of inspired me in the end. I was like, look, I'm going to go make this change now. And I, yeah. I got into the gym and all of a sudden I started realizing how, how much better I felt. Yeah. Um, and it gave me, you know, an hour or so a day just to kind of let go and just be myself, be with myself, work yeah. on myself a little bit and yeah. just kind of just zone out in a sense. Yeah. Sick. I love it. Matt, when was your, um, when was your first like head chef opportunity? Uh, so my first head chef role, my real, my, my real first head chef role was at restaurant Gordon Ramsay. Was it? Yeah. Um, so I was working with Claire Smith. Um, she was the chef patron at the time. Mm-hmm. I worked with her, so I joined her team. Um, is that the same as head chef? Chef patron. Chef patron is uh, like chef chef part owner. Oh, okay. So um, yeah, I joined. I worked with Claire. Mm-hmm. She was chef patron, mm-hmm. um, and then she appointed made me head chef uh, when I was twenty eight um, under her. So essentially, I was responsible for the running of the restaurant, like all the kitchen day to day, making sure we had everything, everyone was doing the right job. You know, things were happening. So. Was that yeah. more or less stressful than being kind of on the? Because you do you cook less the higher you get up. You do, yes. Yeah, it's yeah. an interesting thing that, and it is that. Is it less stressful? Is it more stressful? Is it? Oh, it's more stressful because the the level of pressure, and the expectation, and the responsibility increases. Yeah. So you know the higher and you, you climb probably on feel the like you're in, Do you feel like you're in less control of the food when you're? Um, so, because you're not actually cooking it anymore. No, but then that's when it comes down to the nurturing side where the ability to then show the skill set that I've learned, the things that people have taught me, yes. to then try to teach that onto the, the next generation of yes. the chefs. Yeah, and then and there's how, a level of trust in them as well. Of course, of yeah. course. Um, but I mean, look, in the kitchen that we work in, it's a, very, it's a small environment, so you can see everything that's happening all day anyway. So there's yes. no real, there's nowhere to hide. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and it's not that I don't trust the team or I don't trust people, but it's just the way we are is that, as I said, that attention to detail, yeah. you're always looking for anything that needs improvement or reworking or, or be honest with yourself, go, that's just not good enough. We need yeah. to do it again. Yeah. Um, because for me, what goes on a plate of food, whether it, it's not just about, oh, it's a bit of meat, it's really expensive. We better make sure that's perfect. If it's a little carrot that goes with it, that's just as important for me as the piece of meat or the piece of fish. Yeah. Every element of the dish um, is super important to the experience because it's there for a reason. Yeah. And if one thing lets the side down, we all let the side down. I always tell my team, if the, if the front of house are, you know, are deep in it and they need a hand and the kitchen swimming in the back having a great old time, yeah. if we go down or something happens in the service, we all, we either, we all win together or we lose together. Yeah. There's no us versus you. Like, there's no, it's a team. Yeah. Um, you know, and I'm a big advocate of the, you know, I hashtag it all the time, but it's one of the things I do believe it's one team, one dream. And it was something I was told when I was very young and I've always had that mentality of like, we are in this together. Yeah. Sick. Um, one question that I thought you might get, that, that I thought that you thought you might get at the start is what's it like working for Gordon? Amazing. Is it? Yeah, I mean, look, Gordon for me is an amazing mentor, not only uh, professionally, a friend as well, yeah. um, in and out of work. Yeah. Um, and I've got the most res- utmost respect for him. You know, he allows me to to do what I do every day and he allows me to grow and he pushes, he's the one that helps to push me as well yeah. to to challenge what I'm doing sometimes or to think outside the box or, yeah. you know, to to take on new ideas or to move, help move things forward as well. Yeah. So it helps, he helps you. Cause, cause I was talking to a guy, it's actually a guy who was one of my courses and he, and he worked, I think he might have worked at Claridge's, he's called John, 
Sherrington, he's called. Yep. And he said that, he said, I said, what was it like working there? He said, well, he said, I met Gordon a couple of times. He said, he's a pussycat on TV compared to what he's like in real life. He said, I don't mean that as a, he's a, di- he's a douchebag. He said, his standards are just incredibly high. Yeah. So is that what you, that's what you, yeah, you, his, when, his, you his, when you're around people like that, surely it wants, it, it, it inspires you, right? He's, I'll tell you what, Gordon is one of those people that he walks into the room and there is definitely an aura around him. You can, I don't need to see him or hear him. Yeah. I, can, I can kind of feel it. Like when he's there, you just know his presence is around. Yeah. Um, you know, not only the fact that he's six foot four, but <laughs> it's just that, you know, as I said, we could be, myself and him, we'll be there just having a chat in the middle yeah. of the service. And we're obviously conversating with each other, yeah. both talking to each other, looking at each other, but yeah. both of us are looking at everything that's going on around all the time. <laughs> um, and what I've seen from Gordon is the times I've gone out with him before, or just seen him, you know, he's such a gentleman. He's, his values, his morals, his respect, it's yeah. just second to none. Yeah. Um, and obviously, you know, when you're, when you're someone that famous, everyone comes to you first. Oh, can I get you this? Can I get you that? And he'll yeah. be like, no, can you ask my wife or can you ask the ladies what they would like first? And, yeah. you know, like he is um, one of those people that obviously, yes, he is so famous and yeah. everyone knows what his face looks like. Yeah. Um, but I've I've never seen him turn down a request from anyone. You know, we could walk down the street and someone going, "Can we have a photo?" He'd be like, "Yeah, sure, no worries." Yeah. Um, yeah. I've, he came in. I was at the pub one day having a beer with a few of the guys after work, and he just popped over to see me. And someone came running down. I was like, "Oh, my um, my sister just got married. Would you mind jumping in for a photo?" He's like, "Yeah, sure, no problems." Yeah. Um, just drops it. You know, at any time. You know, nothing's ever too much for him. Yeah, I love that. I love that, Matt. Do you? <laughs> I think this is about all shafts. Do you cook at home? Uh, sometimes. <laughs> I was like, I think that, that was one thing I wrote down there. I was like, I wonder if Matt cooks at home because your wife's a chef as well, yes, right? My wife is an amazing chef as well. Yeah. So we, I mean, to be honest, what we cook at home is always simple. Is it just quick and simple? Um, obviously, being Aussie, I love chucking stuff on the barbecue. Yeah. Um, and then when we have friends over, obviously, we love to entertain. Both of us absolutely love entertaining. Yeah. Um. So yeah, we. We, we'll pull the stops out. We go all the way from... I bet all your friends want to come over from me, right? <laughs> yeah, everyone's like, yeah, can we come to your house? Come to yours. But I think, um, yeah, everyone... Oh, one of those questions, people always panic as well when about, oh, chef's coming over. What do we go cook for? <laughs> so I don't care. I just yeah. really appreciate that someone's going to cook for me for a change. Yeah. Um, and I guess that's the great thing with food and <clears> with uh, hospitality and experiences like that is that you could, you know, my father-in-law one day cooked a barbecue. The steak was so well done, yeah. beyond belief. Yeah. But the company I was with, the time, the moment, yeah. the fact that he'd gone to that effort to cook it for me, yeah. um, you know, I'm sure he was breaking it himself. Yeah. But it was amazing, yeah. even though it was well done. Yeah. It was an amazing experience. And that, that's the main, that's a great thing. that Because it's about that. more than the food. It is more about the food. It's more than just the food. It's, yeah. it's the whole experience. It's everything ties that into yeah. everything. So going back to this, this, this kind of head chef thing at, at restaurant Gordon Ramsay, did you have to get an interview by Gordon? Was it the first time you met him? Was it? No, I'd met Gordon um, many years. Like I met him in Australia. He'd come out for a few book launches and bits and pieces. But, yeah. you know, I was just another one, like, another one of the guys in the kitchen, really. So he doesn't, yeah. wouldn't know me for anything else. But, um, yeah, I'd worked with Claire uh, at Restaurant Gordon Ramsay since uh, 2009. Yeah. Um, and I had come from a, a senior role in at Claridge's mm-hmm. and I basically had to take a demotion to get, to join the team at Restaurant Gordon Ramsay. And, oh, really? Yeah. And I, I walked in there, not cocky, but confident as a chef thinking, yeah, I've got this. Like, yeah. I've worked in some great places. I, I know what I'm doing. Yeah. Uh, and that was the first time when I realized I was like, Phew, don't actually know what I'm doing. Um, oh, really? Because, and that was even coming from Claridge's? Yeah, it's because the attention to detail went from, you know, 99 to 1,000. Really? Um, and it was just, all of a sudden I was like, oh, that's the difference. Yeah. I had that little moment. And um, Was it, the, Matt, because I won't mention this, we're talking about the rabies hunt before. This is my, one of my first experiences of Michelin star dining. And they were using fucking tweezers. And I'm like, we're at the chef's table in there, and I'm like, they, they, they've got they're putting food on a plate with a pair of fucking tweezers. Is that the kind of difference? Yeah, I mean, we weren't using tweezers back in the day. Tweezers yeah. came to us probably around. We started using them probably around about 2013. Really? Um, and they were a game changer for me because I've not got little dainty fingers, <laughs> and trying to put little dainty things on a plate is a very difficult thing yeah. without a set of tweezers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but. 
when you think about it, like I've got some dishes on the menu at the moment. There's we've got a salad on. There's twenty things that go on the plate for the salad. Um, there's a lot of intricacy. There's a lot of there's a lot of small detail. Yeah. Um, that is very important, and you know, having all those little tools, they definitely help out. Yeah. So that was a big old that was a big old jump from Claridge's to restaurant Gordon Ramsay. Yeah, it's just that the level of, as I said, the level of intensity from 99 to 1,000 just made that difference of yeah. attention to detail was yeah. even more prevalent. You know, the we were talking that the, the, the finest, most smallest things that ever before is before every service, we would polish the, uh, the side of the stove as if it was like a Ferrari. Like it's like your sports car. It's like a pride and joy thing. And it was just yeah. that whole level of respect we carried for ourselves made sure your shoes were always immaculate and your, your jacket was always perfectly pressed like if you came in the morning and your jacket was a bit crumpled everyone would start having a, not having to dig it you'd be like you need to go on your jacket because it was a bit creased or um yeah every the attention detail that everyone had for everything was just uh phenomenal yeah and it's mad that because how big how many how many covers is claridges uh claridges when i was there we do sort of on a busy day sort of 200 covers for dinner yeah and there's only 14 tables at... Yeah, Restaurant Gordon Ramsay on a busy service, we do 55 covers for dinner. Jeez, man. You'd think it would be the... My logical brain's thinking, well, surely the it's other ones must... Yeah. Of course, yeah. It's easier because there's less people. you got to also think, we're doing 55 covers. That could be 700, 800 plates of food leave the kitchen. Yeah. And yeah. that's that's the bit that blows my mind sometimes. Yeah. It's like, there's a lot of stuff that comes out of this place. <laughs> Matt, what was lock? Because so, I can tell how much you love the industry. I can tell how much you love your work. I can tell how much you love cooking. What was lockdown like for? It would have been you and your wife, right? Yeah, it was. Uh, lockdown was hard. Yeah. Um. After the first, like after two weeks, I was like, right, I'm gonna go back to work now. Yeah. Um. It was hard, but then I think the third lockdown came around. I started to. I was, I was a lot more relaxed and could enjoy myself a little bit more. And actually, yeah. yeah, having the time with my wife has been amazing. Yeah. And going back to work now, it's like, oh, hang on, we, we go back to not really seeing each other that much anymore. Yeah. And it was, uh, it's been a hard adjustment doing that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's difficult for someone that is so busy all the time. Um, having all this free time was just crazy. Um, I painted the flat. Yeah. <laughs> two weeks to do that. And I yeah. thought, right, never do that again. Thank you. <laughs> Um, and then like yeah. people, that was like people were doing all that. Loads of people started running and then stopped again. Well, I started and, running for sure. Did you start yeah. running? Yeah, did yeah. you? I hate. I, it's one. Of the, it was one activity that I am absolutely against. I am not. My body is not made for running. No, I'm not a runner. No, mine neither. I hate um, it. I'm. I'd much more rather go for a swim or be in the gym. But um, yeah, I started running and it was just, just yeah, five k a day was just again. It was just a half an hour to get out, get fresh air, even yeah. in the middle of winter, and yeah. just kind of you know zone out for a little bit listen yeah. to some music turn out really loud just put my head down and just go for it yeah. and um yeah that was a that was a helping hand for sure and, like, to and get how uh, how cool was reopening reopening was when um, was it uh, so we reopened on the what mid may yeah um i was uh, i so I, I was lucky enough i spent 2 weeks before reopening back in the kitchen developing mm-hmm. a few new dishes for the menu because yeah. we've gone from closing in winter to reopening in spring so we had to move things around. And, and last year we lost spring because we ended up closing just prior. So oh, we, we missed all that part period of the year. So we yeah. missed asparagus, we missed all the peas, all the exciting things. Yeah. So it was <laughs> peas and asparagus. Sorry, always, <laughs> always about the peas and asparagus. I just that. Someone will be listening thinking, peas and asparagus. <laughs> That's when you know you love food. But we, um, yeah, coming back this time, um, I think was, it's been the hardest time. Yeah. Uh, like the third time around. Uh, you know, obviously everyone's life has, has been so changed over the last sort of 18 months. Yeah. Um, it's very difficult to kind of pick it up and start again. Yeah. Uh, and as a chef in the restaurant, even putting that pressure on our suppliers, the people that we rely on is, is everything has been a gamble for them too. It's like, you know, if you're a farmer, you're growing, um, your vegetables, you're like, do we, plant, you don't know what, do we yeah. plant them or not? Yeah. Um, and they also, if you're, you know, the sheep farmer, like, do you, do we send the animals to slaughter or do we keep them a little bit longer? What are we going to do? How yeah. are we going to, how are we going to play this? So it's yeah. been, I mean, it still is a difficult time at the moment trying to balance all these things out. Yeah. Um, but obviously everyone just communicating as much as we can, talking to people and making sure that we're kind of trying to all head toward the same page. And yeah. it's also, I think this time has given me a little bit more uh, flexibility. I've been a little bit more 
patient with things and be like, oh, you haven't got it? No problem. What yeah. have you got? What can I do instead? What what other things? And it's given me, I think, a little spur of inspiration to be a little bit more free with what I'm doing rather than trying to just tell myself I've got to do the same way, the same thing all the yeah. time. And how just, often do you change the menu there? Um, things are always happening. So yeah. there's evolution all the time. Yeah. Um, the thing is, you go imagine you come up with a plate of food on day one, you're happy with it, really happy with it, goes out. Five days later, you could have changed it five times, but such small incremental changes on it that no one as a consumer would really understand or, re- or see. Mm. But you as the chef, as the creator, you're there, you're making those little adjustments, little changes till you kind of get to, as I said, you, you're always moving. I'm always looking at the dishes all the time. There's just yeah. little things. Sometimes you're like, right, we shouldn't put that there. We'll put this or we should put a little bit more, a little bit less of that element. Yeah. Um, and that's also, you know, listening to guest feedback as well. Yeah. Um, and understanding, you know, if everyone's eating all the food or people are leaving bits behind or maybe something I've thought of that I think's quite simple and enjoyable. Mm-hmm. Maybe the guests are finding it a little bit awkward or difficult to eat. So it's about, you know, not being egotistical about, well, tough. It's what I want to do. They've got to eat it like that. You just got to then realize, okay, well, maybe I need to change my approach a little bit here. Yeah. Yeah. I was just, I was I was just thinking that I hadn't actually thought of that until you said that like the the whole guest feedback thing. Is that much criticism in where you're at in your business in that in that restaurant or? It's difficult sometimes in the sense of we obviously we we set our bar here yeah, and I think everyone that comes in that restaurant sets their bar here yes, and it's about us trying to make reach that ascertainable and you close you know, that gap. There, there's the there's the element of what is realistic what can happen mm-hmm. and what isn't real yeah. um, will never happen and yeah. i think this is something that we all do you think about anything in life that you're excited about something that you know you book a holiday six months a year from now or you want to go to a restaurant you book that yeah. the whole time from the moment you've clicked purchase or you've started that process there's a moment of anticipation it builds and yeah builds expectation and build. yeah, yeah expectation yeah. gets yeah. so so big and you can get there sometimes and all of a sudden be like, oh. I think the hard part about what you've got now is we've had a lockdown, so you've got all these delayed, these bookings. I mean, when when I was there, it was only last month. That was a book that, that was for September last year. Yeah. So you've got all that even longer build up for the food, right? Yeah, but you think, I think you think sometimes too, when you, when you go like live music and things, an artist, you know, in a recording studio is phenomenal. Mm-hmm. But then sometimes when they're live, it's not that it's not good, but it sounds different. Of course yeah. it does because they haven't got soundproofing. They haven't got all the gadgets. They haven't got all those elements. Then yeah. maybe they're just having a slightly bad day. Yeah. That's what happens in life. Yeah. Um, and it's it's trying to take away from the experience of, oh, that was a horrible console. That was a horrible experience in yeah. a restaurant. It's yeah. actually I had a really good time and it's trying to understand that. And I think it's, it's how we, that's the pressure that comes upon us as well is to make sure that we meet the bar that people set. Yeah, as, as best as we can. Yeah, and as a chef, I, I mentioned it before as well. Like we were talking about this earlier. What do you eat out often? Do you go to different restaurants? Do you like to? Do you and your wife go to different restaurants? No, I like, love. I love to eat out. I love to go to other places. Yeah. Um it's a passion as well. Yeah, as it is for most people that come to restaurants. So it's a joy. It's a passion. Yeah, um, and for us to go out and enjoy the to be on the other side it's so nice sometimes just to sit there and to chill out and to sit and observe but not really the best part the a good meal for me is when i'm not even actually giving i don't really observe what's actually really going on i'm just sitting there and having a great time yeah i'm not trying to be critical and that's the thing when i go i don't want to be critical i just want to sit there and enjoy myself yeah that must be is it quite hard to switch that i don't know if it's quite like analytical brain off when i was younger i think i was i think because when you're young you don't you don't know, do you? You you go out and you're always looking. Oh, that's a great idea. I could take that. We could do this. Yeah. We could do it. Oh, oh, that that's not right. Yeah. But who? How do you know that that's not right? Um. And I think now in this position I am, and also you know, the experience I've had, it, it brings you back a little bit and makes you a little bit more humble and actually just like, yeah, it's great. Thanks. You just sit there and start to enjoy things as opposed to looking at the nitty gritty. There's no need to look at the nitty gritty. Yeah. You don't need to analyze every single thing. Yeah. Because if you do that, you don't end up enjoying your meal. Yes. Um, and obviously, you know, going out for dinner with my wife is an important time. It's to sit there and talk to each other and have a great time. It's if I'm going to sit there and be like, oh, hang on, I'll take a photo of 50, 50 things and, oh, what's this? And what's that? <laughs> of course, there's things that I do see that we do see that obviously naturally interest us. And yeah. Like, oh, wow, that's amazing. Like, take yeah. a little note of that. Yeah. Um, but most of the time, I just try to look, chill out and yeah. enjoy How often ourselves. do you get to do that? 
What, chill out? Yeah, like chill out when you're out, you and your wife. <laughs> Because if uh, she's a chef, she's doing them hours. Yeah. And so, you said she'd open her, she's opened yeah, her Yeah, she just thing. opened her restaurant uh, last week. Yeah. But listen, we're lucky enough that we both get the same days off. Oh, cool. Um, but of course, it's trying to balance both of our lives, um, what we want to do, uh, catching up with friends, seeing family, um, you know, spending, doing some stuff for ourselves, like going to the gym or exercise class, whatever it is you want to do. You yeah. know, you, you've all got your moments where you need to do your own thing. Yeah. Um, and it's just trying to make the most of those opportunities we get. And yeah, yeah. Do you ever have a cheeky Nando's? <laughs> I wouldn't say a Nando. It's probably a little bit lower than that. <laughs> but there's a time and a place for a kebab or anything. Yeah, like really? Yeah, Is of course. It? Do you ever do like a McDonald's or anything? No, that's one thing I'm not. Um, yeah, Is that, it? That's a no go. I would never have a McDonald's. That's a no go for me. Yeah, I love it. Uh, I've got a because he's here, producer Max here. We always have a discussion about mash. I think it's terrible. If you could do anything with a Mac, what a guess we've got here for this. If you could do anything with a potato, right? And there's a lot of things you can do with a potato. Mm. What would you do? What's your, f- sorry, not what would you do? What's your favorite? Ooh. Ooh, it depends. He's probably going to come up with something that we've never had. Yeah, it's a real good one. You've one. got, what, what kind of things can you do with the potato? You've got the uh, fondant that I don't think I've ever had. Yeah, potato fondant. I mean, I do, ooh. I mean, potato dough from ours. Oh, dude, yeah. Or pom boulanger, which is the same, but with stock instead of the cream. I've never had it. What was that? So, pom, pom boulanger. Pom boulanger. Yeah. So, basically, that traditional dish of that was that that was something the bakers used to cook for themselves. So, right. they sliced lots of potatoes, a little bit of shallot or onion, some garlic, thyme, um, layer all that up, and then put a bit of uh, stock on it. And then, basically, Ooh. they used to put it into the, the bread oven at the end of the baking, at the end of the morning of the baking. Yeah. And they would just allow that to cook in the, as, as the oven slowly cooled down. And then when they finished their day, they'd have their sort of breakfast or their lunch. Um, I'm seeing that. Yeah, I mean, there, there's so many... Pot- back with you? There's so, there's so many good <laughs> things you could do with potatoes. But is mash one of them? Uh, yeah, I do love mash. Yeah. Oh, do you? Yeah, yeah. Extra buttery. Uh, see, yeah, well, I'm, um, that, I'm, yeah. Basically, what you're saying is you like butter. Yeah. <laughs> everything's better with butter. It's true. No, if I I'm going to make mash, I am definitely one part potato, three parts butter. Really? Yeah. So how do I make an amazing mash then? It's all about the potato. Is the it? The right potato, yeah. What, what's the best potato for uh, mash? Potato that we like to use for mash is uh, raté, which is a French variety. Okay. Uh, it's a little bit waxy. Um, but this is the thing, like, potatoes are such a, a not overrated, they're, they're an underestimated product. Mm-hmm. Um, there's so many things. You know, if you try to make some fries or some chips at home, yeah. And they go a bit brown. It's because yeah. they're too sugary. So they're probably really old. Yeah. Or they're being kept too cold. This is so, like the crazy thing. Like there's so many elements of understanding. Um, you dude, know, this is the, I never thought I'd be having this conversation. There's a right potato for the right job. Let's just say that. <laughs> there's not one potato that does all. <laughs> Man, I never thought I'd be having this conversation with you about <laughs> potatoes. So uh, the right potato for the right job. And there's a lot of different kinds of potatoes and there's a lot of different things you can do. Yeah, yeah, that's what you're saying, right? Time, 100%. I love it. Um, I had another question for you that's just completely jumped out of my mind. Ma- Here it is. How do you... So we've talked about stress. That's the first thing I think of when it comes to running a restaurant, working in that kitchen. Like, how do you deal with that? Do you have a technique? Do you have a strategy? Do you think it's just natural? Do you think it's experience? Do you think it's... <sighs> That's a good question. Like, if service think, is going tits up, which I don't know how often that's happened to you in where you're at now, but if service is going tits up, like, what's yeah? The thing for me, I think if something's, like, getting out of control, yeah. it's, I will try to stop it, or I just need to step in and take control at that point. Because, yeah. obviously, in the kitchen, I might be there running the pass or have my sous chef running the pass and mm-hmm. things might happen. Like we might have little incidences or, yeah. you know, what I call firefighting. Some yeah. little problem will happen here, there, everywhere. At that moment in time, you need to grab it, take the best resources that you have available to you to yeah. solve that problem yeah, and then refocus on bringing it back or going to get back to where we are. Yeah. And there's the one thing in a kitchen that you never have, you can never have enough of, you can never bring time back. So if we lose time on one table, that's going to affect every single table after that. It's yeah. very, very hard to make time up. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think like with the stress thing, I think that's come from experience and maturity and time because it's all about, it's, it's a, it is about experience. It's yeah. about understanding. It's also it's about understanding people. 
Um, you know, we've got, I've got people in the kitchen that you can pressurize a little bit more or give them more responsibility and they will thrive in that environment. Yep. And there's other people, if it starts to get too stressed or too much pressure on them, they will start to kind of unravel. Mm -hmm. So you need to realize the, your not the, the strengths, the weaknesses of your team and, and play the, you know, it's about playing your players in the right position and right. Okay. I need them to do that, but they're not gonna be able to do it on their own. So who's the best person I can move over there or get them to help and yeah. kind of get that problem resolved or fix, you know, do whatever we need to do, then yeah. readjust. And that's yeah. the biggest thing with the kitchen is, you know, I, <laughs> We do. We walk. We move around the kitchen so much. Not just standing still all day long, yeah. just cooking. No one just stands still and cooks. Yeah. There's so much movement, and there's this teamwork and camaraderie. And it's it's about right. Okay, the the canapes are getting slammed at the start of service. We all jump on that. Then we yeah. go to the next course, and everyone moves around all the yeah. time. So yeah. What as as somebody that I I I think anyway, you'll not you'll not buy into this because you're too humble for this. As somebody that's gone from like starting in any trade so, and you're at the top of your game right now, right? Yep. You obviously, I know that you still think that you've still got a, a lot of room to go. go. There's a, a long, long way, way to go. go. Yeah. Yeah. I can tell that. What are some of the things that anybody listening, even if they're not a chef, even if they're not in the hospitality trade, what are some of the key, what are some of the key things that you think people need to be doing to become the best? Uh, consistency is one of them consistency attitude mm -hmm. dedication mm -hmm. um and it's resilience yeah you need to you know you get knocked down you got to get back up again you got to go back for it again even yeah. if it's even if it hurts or if it's it seems too awkward you've just got to keep trying and trying and never give up yeah um because i'm a firm believer of if you you know if you keep trying you keep getting there you will get there eventually yeah you know it might take someone a day, a week, a month to get there and it might take someone else yeah. double that amount of time. But yeah. provided you keep that perseverance and keep moving yeah. forward, um, you will, you can achieve whatever, you know, there's no, I think we are, we ourselves are the only people that put limitations on ourselves. Mm -hmm. Has there ever been a point where you were like, fuck this? There's been many a time. <laughs> <laughs> what might you have done instead? Uh, I don't know. Look, when I was younger, there's times where you wake up some days, you're going to work, you're just like, oh, I can't be bothered. Yeah. But I still get up in bed, still went to work. Yeah. You get in there and all of a sudden you're like, I love it. Yeah. Um, there's always times of challenge and, you know, there's times that we all face that things happen that are, are far out of our control. But I think as, when we're acting as a leader and when you're in that position, you feel somewhat responsible for what goes on. Mm. Um even might be the most smallest insignificant amount, but you still feel responsible. And when crisis or things happen of, of, of great shock or things like that in the team, um, you know, I look at my team as, and they're not my just colleagues. They're my friends. Yeah. They're my family. Um, so if they've got a problem outside of work, that's going to affect inside of work. And, you know, I don't need to, I always tell them, look, I don't need to know the nitty gritty, but if you need anything, just come and ask. Yeah. No matter what it might seem like, it's, yeah. Um, and that's one of the great things that I've also learned, you know, of, of recent times. It's about not trying to be too proud and just, you know, slog away at it. Just ask for help. I think this is it. more than just work for you though, right? Yeah, of course. I can hear that every, every word you're saying. I'm like, this is more than just work for you. No, this, is, this, is, this isn't for me. I don't go to work every day because I get paid. Yeah. I go to work because I love what I do. Yeah. Um, and I think that's the difference. That's one of the greatest things that I believe that, the job that I have gives me the opportunity to do something that I love to do versus something that I have to do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it is a pleasure. It does, you know, I love, there's nothing more than I love to cook something or create something can to, well, not only bring along the talent within my kitchen and my team and to watch a young chef grow and get better and better at something that they thought was impossible or unachievable, unattainable yeah. for them, but also then to see how that react, moves to a guest experience. Um, you know, I'm, I'm really bad at taking compliments. I'm like, Oh, cool. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, like, I, I kind of get a bit embarrassed about it sometimes, but yeah. when, when I, I reflect on that later on, you think about it and all of a sudden you're like, wow, we've just created this magical moment for someone. Yeah. Um, but I've just done what I like to do. Yeah. I didn't have to <laughs> seem to leak. I didn't have to go out of my way. I just did what I like to do every day. Yeah. 
Um, and they're the moments that I really kind of, you sit back and you think, wow, this is, this is a great job. This is a great thing that I've done. Um, yeah. and we do as a team because it's yeah. not, people always say, oh, it's not, it's not me. It's a team. Mm. We are a team and we only, we only, as I said before, we only win and we only lose as a team. It, well, there has to be. It's not a, um, it's not you, me. It's not me, one person if you're just in the kitchen person there cooking, running around. It's going to take quite a while to get <laughs> a meal take, out. Yeah, I'll do a table of two and that's it. <laughs> Um, you know, it is everyone and it is all people of all different skill sets and levels yeah. of ability. Yeah. Um, and it's also, you know, as that leader, it's also about understanding and realizing people's potential and trying to push those people yeah. um, and encourage that kind of potential out of them and yeah. get them to sort of move on, move forward with it. But also it's about not being selfish. And when you have people there have, you know, reached their ceiling of opportunity potential with you, it's then to encourage them to move on and to see something else. And this is amazing. Yeah, that's really, that that's a really interesting thing that, that, uh, that, that I've obviously I've followed you for a bit now where there's genuine, because part of you must be sad when great people, of course, leave your team. Cause you're like, fucking hell, you're really good. Do you have to go? <laughs> part of you must be like, do you have to? Yeah. But then it's amazing that, that you're wanting them to kind of push on as well. You do because, all I can think of is that people gave me opportunities in my career. Yeah. So I want to try to give back and give other people great opportunities. Yeah. And, and look, at the end of the day, if someone goes on and then doesn't like it, they can always come back. Yeah. Um, but I've not seen, if you've killed that relationship. Of course, of yeah. course. And I've seen many, I've seen, many, I've worked with many people that have worked in the industry and, you know, have left the restaurant to go and see something else, whether it to be go and travel, go another country or just go work somewhere else. And for whatever reason, it didn't work out mm -hmm. or they just didn't enjoy it. And then they come back yeah. Um, because there is something special, um, I think, about the environment sometimes where you can, it can annoy you, it can frustrate you. You can be like, why? Why do we do this? Why is this? And, yeah. you know, we always have this, the grass is green on the other side thought. But then when you get there and you come back, you're like, actually, I really loved it. I love it. And yeah. that's. That's something, you know, not everyone always feels that, yeah. but when you, yeah, when you have that great talent, you have to let them move on. You have to, because you have to let people grow. Yeah. There's no point in being selfish and trying to keep it all for yourself. Do you know, do you know that thing's crazy, Matt, when like you said that? Like, I always think whenever I watch any kind of cooking show, whenever I eat in a restaurant, I'm like, how would food's been around for like ever? How are people still coming up with new fucking recipes? Do you know what I mean? There must be, I can't, I can't understand how there's still new recipes coming out. How there's still, it's crazy how there's like, oh, that's a new combination. It's crazy that, isn't it? It is, but that's, that's the amazing thing. With, it is. I think with, with travel around the world and with greater understanding of different cultures, different cuisines, and yeah. different products, when you, as a chef, because this is a great thing, it's an artistic element. You get a freedom to do what you want. It's yeah. like, as an artist, if you're painting something, if you're drawing something, you do whatever you want. No one yeah. can tell you, oh no, that's not right. You yeah. just, they either like it or they don't. And yeah. It's the same with food. You either like it or you don't. Yeah. Um, and that's one of the things I think I try to look at with criticism from, you know, with what we do sometimes. Yeah. If someone says, oh, I don't like it. Yeah. Cool. Maybe I that's just them. I don't like McDonald's. Yeah, but maybe, <laughs> but maybe that's just them. Yeah. Maybe it's not that there's a problem with it. Just personally, they didn't enjoy they it. They like the taste. So that's, that's that's something you just have to okay cool yeah Can where do, do you else? where do you when you're coming up with a new recipe like what's the or when you're coming up with a new dish like what's your thought process uh so my thoughts always enter my mind at the most random moments there's no like structure into that that moment it could be the it could be in one of those crazy moments in service yeah i'm like oh what about this or that or yeah. it could be the moment i'm just about to try to fall asleep <laughs> and an idea pops in my head and i'll be like i'll remember that for the morning yeah um, you know, or driving the car or anything you do. You know, things yeah. come all the time. I like to, I, you know, it all, sometimes it does come from inspiration. You know, I might, I've got a massive, massive cookbook collection, much to my wife's uh, <laughs> dismay, but it continues to grow all the time. Yeah. Um, and have I read every cookbook I've got? No, I haven't. Yeah. But I use them as a point of reference. Yeah. So sometimes you might go and look at something. It could be from the seventies, the eighties. It could be from a chef that's just released a book recently. Yeah. And it's not. It's not about taking the idea, but sometimes mm. it's about taking inspiration. Going, yeah. oh, actually, I can do something with a piece of chicken or whatever it is. I can make it look like that. Or, oh, that's an idea. And then I'll take an idea and I'll do a bit of research on it, and then I can then evolve that or make yeah. it my own or yeah. or reimagine what I want it to be. And be like, well, I don't like the sauce. It was too. 
rich. So how yeah. am I going to make it lighter for my style of food? Yeah. Um, and then I tend to creatively will draw things down. Yeah. So I try to, you know, draw a little doodle of what I think the dish might look like of how I want it to. And oh, really? Write, and then I'll write down all the things that I want to put on this dish, yeah. potentially. Yeah. Um, and then as I start the development process, I'll be like, oh, actually, on cross off, cross off, cross off, take off majority of them. Yeah. Like, right. We're closer now. Yeah. Um, and then it's a case of, of making things, sometimes failing, making again and again and again till you start to get it right. And then bringing that together as an actual plate of food. So is this just you tasting it or? Uh, it's myself, my sous chef, my yeah. sommelier. Yeah. Um, I will always try something myself first and be like, no, sometimes you're like, no, nah, shit. Let's yeah. go back and start <laughs> yeah. again. No one yeah. else needs to see that one. Do you ever have anything that you think shit, but everyone else thinks amazing? Um, this is one of those things too. I think when you're, it, it's about finding the right people to be mm. around and to ask the right people's opinion, the opinions you value, because if, you know, if you value someone's opinion, um, when you're the boss or when you're the leader of a team, mm -hmm. Everyone's going to tell you, yeah, yeah, it's great. It's great. It's great. Yeah, yeah. You don't want that. You need the truth. Um, so it's about choosing the right people and having people being very honest with you and actually saying, oh, what about this? What about that? And sometimes you're like, yeah, that's a great idea. Yeah. Because that, that's all it takes. It just takes one little spark of an idea or, or, or letting that happen. And then all of a sudden, one idea from what was going to be good turns into excellent. Yeah. Um, and that can come from anyone or anything. Yeah. Um, that could be one of my most junior members of the team. It could be like, oh, chef, at this old restaurant, we used to, my, where are you worked before? I used to do this. Or yeah. what about that? Or it could be from someone's cultural background. Oh, well, my mom does this with that. You're like, oh, wow, that's like, okay, how do I make that now a yeah. reality? Or how do we now make that what we can do here in the restaurant? Yeah. So there's a lot of, um, it's, it's, it's never a set amount of time for development. Development yeah. just comes. Yeah. And do you ever, <laughs> do you know when the Michelin star people come? Do you know when they come in? Sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes. Sometimes you're on the grave. How often do they come? Uh, well, I, I mean, look, so when I say you know them, sometimes they're there because you may have seen their face oh, yeah. before. Yes. Some, so this is where my front of house are absolutely amazing. They, that, that I, attention Snitches. to detail. They Snitches. Can, they, can, they can see people. They can read that. Yeah. Um, but look, sometimes they say, oh, can we speak to the chef? Or no, yeah. sort of, so you're like, oh, cool. It's yes. all done. It's all good. Yeah. Um, I think with your attitude though, Matt, I think you're probably treating every day and every meal like they're there anyway, right? Yeah, but the thing is, I don't look. We work. We're we're fortunate to have three Michelin stars. You know, yeah. that's that's the, the accolade that we've held for you know over twenty years now. Yeah, but I don't come to work to work for those three stars. I come to work because what we do, I love that attention to detail. Yeah, and through what my uh, passion that we have and what we do, that is. Uh, an award that we're obviously honoured to receive and yeah. to, to hold. Yeah. But I don't work for that award. Yeah. That's just the side effect. That's just the side effect. Yeah. Exactly right. Yeah. Who's the most famous person you've ever cooked for? Uh, Apart from the boss. <laughs> yeah, that was a bit daunting day, that was for sure. Oh, well, let's talk about that then before <laughs> you go there. How did that, what was that? Was that a test? Was it a... No, I think it's just, um, look, I think as a young chef, when you when you cook, put up a plate of food for, you know, for a mentor, yeah. of, you very much, you very value their opinion, of yes. course. And it's a daunting, daunting task. And I think if you walked into it, be like, oh, it's going to be fine. It's going to be no problems. Yeah. Then and I did he cook think, one of his dishes or was no, it your no, own? No, no, Something like things that, yeah, like Gordon will come and try things that I've got on the menu. Oh, they could have already been on the menu for three months. Yeah. By the time he actually gets to try some stuff sometimes. Yeah. But it's just, it's, the great, this is what I'm trying to say with food is that there's no necessary right or wrong. It's a person's opinion. Yeah. So he could say to me, oh, I don't like this because of da 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 And I can be like, well, I've done it like this because of da And then all of a sudden I'll be like, oh, actually, I didn't think of that reason. But there's times when, yeah, he told me stuff and I'll be like, oh, I should have thought of that myself. Like, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. And there's other things where he'll say that, look, I think you could do this or that, but it's your dish. So you... You do what you want. It's a creative license. So what I'm hearing is you you don't see any of it as criticism. You see it all as ideas. Yeah. I mean, yeah. sometimes, look, sometimes you do take some things as criticism, for yeah. sure. Like someone might say something, you'd be like, oh, hang on. But then this all comes from confidence too. If you know what you're doing every day, mm -hmm. look, if 99 portions of that were perfect and one person didn't like one thing, yeah. then take a pinch of salt yeah that's a personal opinion yeah if there was 99 problems and one good one yeah well then we know we've got a problem yeah 
Um, but you know, luckily we don't have those issues. But yeah. It's it's all it is a difficult one sometimes how you sort of take that that balance and yeah. but it's again it's personal as to what you want to take what you want from it. Yeah, see. So the most famous person you've cooked for is You must get quite a few celebs in that restaurant, right? Yeah, we've had a few people over the years. Yeah. We've had a few people. Um That's really hard. I'd, I'd, who's the who's the person that you've cooked for where you've been like, yeah, that's cool. Apart from James and Darren. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, when he, the boss sent me a message, the boss sent me a message of like this, that fucking chef just sent me a message. I've seen fucking, I've just paid for it. He had message me. <laughs> 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 yeah. Uh, i trying to think. Um, I think for myself, it's probably, I'll tell you what, the, it's not necessarily the most famous, but one of the most important meals or things that I cook for was uh three years ago cooking for my old head chef in australia that was that, that was like is a, cool that was a moment of um yeah it was really nice to be from when i was that 17 18 year old kid to now yeah. being 30 you know 36 now but yeah. being at that point and be like hey look this is what i've done yeah. my career this is where i'm at yeah. i'm gonna experience this and that yeah. was a that's an amazing um yeah. you know opportunity matt have you ever had the old um have you had opportunities to go on the old TV yet? Uh, yeah, I get. Uh, I've done uh, Master Chef. The professionals they invite me for the black tie dinner. For the oh, last, cool! Last few years, so so you get to give the feedback. You gotta, yeah, you come and give, give critiques. Um, yeah, it's uh, yeah. Look, that's not easy. I mean, look, these people coming out and cooking for the room, the people they've got to cook yeah, for. I mean, no, I've, that, I don't know. I, that's the thing. I too don't know how I'd perform in yeah. that situation. You know what's mad? That, that when I watch that, I hate those first few rounds on Master Chef the Professionals, you know, where they've got like gutter fish. Yeah. And I'm like, he knows how to do it. He's just nervous. Like I'm watching them, I'm like, surely he knows how to gutter fucking fish. But then the people just lose it on the TV, don't they? But I think this is the hard thing too, I think, as like being a chef, when you're in your kitchen, in your environment, with your team, yeah, you can do anything, yeah, because it's your little bubble. You're, you're safe, you're, yeah. you're comfortable, yeah. And I remember a few years ago, I went and did my first like live demo. Yeah, um, I was bricking it, oh, yeah. I was sweating buckets before I went on stage. And even though I had someone that I trust very well next to me helping me out and you know doing the bits and pieces, but it was I was just really thankful that there was someone like Emma seeing it talking to me. Otherwise I'd probably forget to talk. I'd just be cooking, like doing what I love. I was like, yep, yeah, just do this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's, it's, um, yeah, it's one of, it's a hard thing. Like, cause I do, I love to talk. I mean, I love to talk to people about food. I love, I, it's what I love. Yeah. You know, I can talk days, weeks, months, years about it. Yeah. Um, but it's trying to combine the two of what I'm trying to do professionally whilst yeah. trying to entertain other people. That's yeah. the, that's definitely a skill that I've had to learn over and dude, the years. And being a, being a head chef, the opportunity for you to say, oh yeah, I'll just leave, I'll just leave the restaurant to make it t to go and do some TV stuff. That must be almost, that must be really challenging for you to be, even be able to say yes to. It, it is, but at the same time, that's why I try to build an amazing team around me and have people, you have to trust them, you know, you have to let them go. Otherwise you have to close the restaurant every time I had to take a day off, which just wouldn't happen. Yeah, so that, yeah. it's how you, you know, it's, it's difficult and I'll tell you now like it's something that I'm still working on personally it's like that kind of letting it go and yeah. understanding is because but that's this all comes back down for me is that nothing not nothing's ever good enough but it's yeah. that constant like what can we do how do I make it better yeah always looking for that extra little bit all yeah. the time I love it Matt Abe what a fucking pleasure I could sit here all day and talk to you <laughs> uh, mate thank you so much where can the people that are listening in uh, find out more about what it is and what you do um, well they can follow me on Instagram I love Matt's in <laughs> Matt's Instagram is lit it's just lots of food yeah <laughs> lots of food yeah yeah uh, yeah so it's uh, yeah Chef Matt Abe and, um, um, oh, mate it's Matt Abe shit I've been saying yeah. your name wrong the whole fucking right. do you there's, get it all there's the time? an accent on there I do yeah is that I do shit Gordon, Gordon even gets it wrong too so it's fine <laughs> don't worry about it so it's Matt Abe M-A-T-T-A-B-E -T -T yep chef at the start yep have you got blue tick right I've got a blue, got tick. blue tick. I do, yes. He's got a fucking blue tick. Jeez. <laughs> Matt Abbey, thank you so much, pleasure. my friend. Thank Cheers. Cool. Thank you. Cheers, mate.